So hi, everybody. I am Angela, and welcome and thank you for joining us for day two of the California Conference. So I want to start off, in case you haven't met the California team, um, it would be myself. I'm Angela. I'm the California State Director. And then Nico is our senior organizer, and he covers uh, Northern California, works with our volunteers and partners up there. And then Leslie, wave Leslie, is our uh, Southern California senior organizer, works with our volunteers and partners up there as well. So a few tips um, as we get started today. So please remember to keep yourself muted and silence your cell phones. Life happens, but try to minimize distractions. You can ask questions or make comments by writing in the chat. And just a reminder that this is just for general information only. If you have specific questions related to your, or yours or your loved one's health, you can always email us afterwards and we have a, um, end of life consultants that we can connect you with. So for today's agenda, we are going to um, do an update on medical aid and dying, and then we're going to have a networking opportunity again, so you can meet who else is um, on the Zoom. We're going to talk about faith and end-of-life perspectives. Uh, we'll have a death talk with voluntary stop eating and drinking, LA patient advocates, and navigating medical aid and dying. Uh, Karen Morin is with us and is going to share some information. And then we're going to talk about envisioning the future that we want um, for California and how to really keep this movement going. Hi, everyone. So as we get started, we did just want to take a moment to recognize a few of our advocates that helped advance our mission that we've lost in recent years. So I want to start with Andrew Flack. Andrew was a teacher, a hockey fan, an advocate living with advanced cancer. He used California's End of Life Option Act and passed away on November 16, 2022, at the age of 34. He spent his last year advocating for medical aid and dying in his home state of Illinois, where his family lived and where he wanted to return. But because he wanted the option of medical aid and dying, he stayed in California. He worked to build awareness about this compassionate option as a storyteller through his blog and po podcast, and as a proposed intervener in the 2022 lawsuit that attempted to undermine the California End of Life Option Act. I had a few phone conversations with Andrew, and the thing that I most remember is he always just lightened the mood. That's something that after I talked to him, I always felt better. So that's something that I'm always going to remember of Andrew. And next up, I want to talk about Alina Hammer, who I know a lot of you work closely with. Alina was a community and political activist living with lymphoma and a brain tumor. She fiercely advocated for patient-directed care and medical aid in dying. She was committed to living and dying on her own terms. She was also the action team leader for the Santa Cruz Action Team and a valued member of CNC's LGBTQ plus advisory council. She passed away peacefully in her sleep. And Alina, again, I worked with her closely for many years and she, every time I worked with her, she always had such a great spirit, and I know she touched the lives of a lot of people, and we continue to remember her. And lastly, we want to talk about Matthew Fairchild. He was a retired Army Staff Sergeant and lived in Burbank with terminal melanoma that had spread to his bones, lungs, and brain. In 2018, he had not received a prognosis of six months or less to live, but wanted the option of medical aid and dying when he did. So he joined as an intervener in the 2018 lawsuit attempting to overturn the California End of Life Option Act. An outdated law from 1997 that prohibits federal funds being used in medical aid and dying made this peaceful option challenging for Matthew to access since he, since he was a member in the VA. Matthew and his friend advocated to Congress to change this law, but were unsuccessful. When it came time for him to be eligible for medical aid and dying, his friends gifted him the money to cover the expenses of going through the process. And he's always gonna be remembered as a fierce fighter so again, we just wanted to take a moment to recognize these advocates and all the advocates across the nation that we've lost that we continue to remember and continue to inspire this movement. And then most recently, um, Jose became an advocate with Compassion and Choices. And I'm gonna share a quick video um, that he wanted to do uh, before he died. So just one moment.
Uh, vivo en Wilmington, California. Oh, estoy en hospital. Ya ahorita casi no me puedo levantar de la cama. Traigo convulsiones cuando le pega calentura. No puedo yo así, no se lo deseo a nadie esto. Ya no tengo cura yo. Y me pusieron lo que me pusieron de medicamentos y todo eso, eso no me iba, nunca me, no me iban a ayudar. Más bien me iba a dañar más mi, mi cuerpo. Yo ya estoy preparado para esto. Lo bueno es que hay esta opción para uno. Porque... Tanto sufrimiento, uh, dolor. Yo esto es lo que yo quiero. El final de la vida. Ya no tiene cura uno de este cáncer. La última cita que tuve con el oncólogo, la doctora me decía, no, que estoy bien. Le dije yo, no, pues yo no estoy bien, yo no me siento bien. Y yo digo, pero ¿por qué no apoyarme? Que yo te estoy dividiendo. Si tú ves que yo no tengo cura, ¿por qué me quieres seguir poniendo más tratamientos? Esos tratamientos a mí no me ayudan en nada. Pues ahí fue cuando ya me transfirieron aquí y, y ya pude yo llegar a este punto ahorita, casi como estoy ahorita. Pues la doctora eso no, la oncóloga no. Eso nunca, me, más bien me decían que eso no, que aquí en California no era permitido, más bien así me decían siempre. Pues mi familia le dio tristeza cuando yo les dije esto. Pero lo tomaron de esa manera ellos y dijeron, no, papá, pues es mejor para ti. Y pedí perdón a las personas que yo he dañado, que he ofendido. Y yo ya le pedí perdón a mi Dios. Y yo ya estoy listo. So, um, Jose passed away peacefully, surrounded by his children and loved ones a few weeks ago on March 31st. Jose's story really speaks to the importance of Eva's presentation last week and efforts to really reach out to Latino and Spanish-speaking communities. Uh, so we are really grateful that Jose wanted to speak up in his final days towards working, towards getting education and information out there to people so that they can make informed decisions about their end of life and try to prevent others from suffering as much as he did. Even while in ha going in hospice, going through the medical aid and dying process, he was unaware he could ask for more pain relief. So I also want to extend a big thank you to Karen Morin, who will be presenting later today, who helped get him enrolled in a supportive hospice and helped him navigate his care during the last few weeks of his life, as well as Stephanie Elkins, who presented last week. Both Stephanie and Karen texted with his caregivers on the day of his ingestion to prepare them for what to expect um, when the ingestion happened, but also remind him, his children and his loved ones to share how much they loved him. And, you know, to think 
for him to share what would make this time meaningful to him. And he wanted to listen to specific music and wanted people to pray with him. So um, we also wanted to recognize our advocates who have been doing this work day in and day out for decades and celebrate their achievements. Dolores pictured here served as a consultant on the Karen Ann Quinlan New Jersey Supreme Court case, uh, the first right to die in the USA. If you aren't familiar with this case, in 1975, Karen Ann Quinlan was a 21 year old who after returning home from a party, lost consciousness and stopped breathing. Her friends called an ambulance and tried to resuscitate her, but she had been without oxygen for too long and was left in a persistent vegetative state. Her parents wanted to remove her from the ventilator, but the doctors were hesitant to do so out of fear that they would be charged with homicide. The case made it to the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, where it was ruled 7-0 to zero that privacy rights assured a person's prerogative to forego life-sustaining medical treatment, and that in this case, a parent could make the decision for Karen. In 1976, California became the first state to pass legislation called the California Natural Death Act, which was the first living will established in the country. After the case, Dolores was appointed by the New Jersey Commission on Health to the first Hospital Ethics Committee. In New Jersey, she tackled such challenging issues as deciding who would, re who would receive life-saving renal dialysis when only two machines were available. She was appointed and served on various national health care boards, including the American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, and the American Association of Nurse Executives. Dolores was also a founder of the New Jersey chapter of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. Today, Dolores volunteers to teach a class on end-of-life options to older adults through the Renaissance Society of Sacramento, among other activities. We are so grateful for all the work Dolores has done for this movement and lucky to have her on our team. And she's also on this call today. Thank you, Dolores. Yes, thank you, Dolores. She is a mover and a shaker for sure. Um, so thank you for all the work that you've done over the years. So I just wanted to give a quick snapshot of the latest California End of Life Option Act report. So every year, the California Department of Public Health issues a report where they will say how many unique doctors uh, prescribed medication, how many people received a prescription, and how many Californians uh, self had self-ingested the medication. Um, and then it also provides other information such as how much, um, you know, what was the terminal illness that the person had requested it for, and then what is their age range, um, what's their education level. So we get some information from that. So what's important about this most recent report is that this was the first report that came out after that SB 380 had been enacted, which was the improvement bill for the California End of Life Option Act. So we saw that there was a 47% increase in the ability for people to access medical aid in dying, um, which we really attribute to most likely was caused from, there used to be a 15 day waiting request from when you could um, make the first request to your doctor to the second request. And that has been now shortened to a minimum 48 hours from when you make the first request to the second request. And next, Nico. And I also wanted to share that the California Department of Veterans Affairs, so CalVet, also adopted new regulation around end of life that will help protect terminally ill veterans partners. So initially this had been introduced uh, by a state senator as a bill, and then CalVet decided that they were just gonna go ahead and change the rules internally. So previously, again, due to that concern with the outdated federal law from 1997 that prohibited federal funds um, from having anything to do with medical aid and dying, CalVet would evict both the veteran and their spouse or domestic partner if the veteran choose medical aid and dying, which often, you know, would leave the veteran who was dying feeling like their loved one was now going to be homeless if they chose this option. So now, as effective last year, if a veteran chooses medical aid and dying as their end-of-life option, their spouse or partner is protected and cannot be kicked out of the state veteran's home for this reason. Additionally, last year, after years of not having any clear guidance, the California Department of Social Services released their California End-of-Life Option Act policy 
stating that all residents living in assisted, assisted living facilities, in addition to a few other adult care facilities, have the right to take their medication in their home and cannot be evicted for choosing this option. Next, Nico. So over the last year, medical aid and dying bereavement support groups have really started coming up as a result from hearing from loved ones that chose this end of life option, um, that they were experiencing unique differences from others in bereavement groups. So to my knowledge, I think there is like, off the top of my head, there's three in California, um, and then there's a few others across the country. So mostly they're online and they're free and available to those who are grieving from a loved one who used medical aid and dying, um, no matter where you live in the United States. Next. So this past fall, um, a free medical aid and dying preparation group began in response to also hearing from loved ones in these bereavement group groups. So loved ones reported not feeling fully prepared and educated enough on what to expect and what to do the day of ingestion. So again, because of this outdated law from 1997 that prohibits federal funding from paying for medical aid and dying, there's a lot of confusion um, through Medicare about how much hospice staff can be involved during with can support a patient during this process. So most hospices that are supportive will try to help the loved ones, but still require staff to leave before the ingestion and not return until death. So members from these bereavement groups have shared that they didn't feel supported, that they didn't have access to a space where they could ask questions, that they didn't feel they were fully prepared for what ingestion day looked like, and that they weren't guided and reminded to say all the things such as I love you and thank you and goodbye to their loved one before ingestion. Next. And then in Last Flight Home, the award-winning filmmaker Andi Timoner shares her family's journey of celebrating the extraordinary life and navigating the intentional death of her father, Eli, Eli Timoner, who died on March 3rd, 2021 at age 92 after availing himself to the California End of Life Option Act. Andi has become a huge advocate since for medical aid in dying and has partnered with us to host multiple screenings um, followed by panel discussions in California and also across the country to let Certainly people know. I know. Hi. Can you guys meet people, please? Um, to help with campaigns across the country. And then in Washington, D.C., they also held a screening of this, followed by meeting with legislators to advocate to repeal, again, that outdated law from 1997. Next slide. And then so just some key information to take away. So California is the only state that has a sunset provision to its law. So this means that it will go away on January 1st of 2031 if we don't get it reauthorized. So I do want to just um, put it on your radar that we will need help and support to go back to the state legislature. Um, and we're hoping to get it reauthorized, but also to remove the sunset provision and make it a permanent law here in California. And then as you heard from Kevin last week, even since the California law was, ever since the California law had been enacted, there have been attempt after attempt to try to chip away at it or overturn it. Um, so again, this is pretty specific to California. Uh, there's one other lawsuit that I know that challenged the law and that was in New Mexico. Um, so we will continue to keep defending this law. And then we're always looking for people to volunteer to help share information about medical aid and dying and other end of life options available in your communities. If you do want to get more involved, we will send out a link in the follow up email that you can fill out. And that is it on my end. Great. And so we will be doing the breakout sessions now, correct? Yes. So we can go into a breakout session for five minutes. And if you all want to talk about, you know, something that you learned last week or something that you're interested in learning about today, um, or just chat amongst yourself, um, and we will come back in five minutes and go to the next presentation. When you see the breakout section appear on your screen, just click it to enter your breakout room.
I think, Angela, during this part, I'm just going to go and pause the recording. That should be okay, right? And then we can resume it once everyone comes back. All right, you're muted. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Last time we just kept it on. Okay. Do people join their breakout rooms? We still see a lot of people in here. Yeah. Folks, if you can go ahead, uh, a window should have popped up um, to go ahead and join a breakout room. In here. For me too, it popped up like a little number and then it says breakout rooms. On the bottom, there's like a little notification where it says more and you can join that way too. Or we can just chit chat here. I think there's just a couple of us in here. Hi, Dolores. You're on mute. I'm I'm here, but I'm also doing something else in the meantime. That's that is okay. Going to, that's why I didn't go into a breakout room. That is okay. Um, I see Leonard, and it, it looks like Leonard, you have someone with you, maybe too. Yeah, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, this is Judy Raffle, who's my significant other. Hi, and Judy. I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. I can't understand Nico. Um, and I've got closed captions on, so that's helpful. But uh, I, I just can't hear him very well. I can hear Angela just fine. Um, and I was in the breakout room last week, which I found useful, but I didn't feel a need for it this week. So I'm just listening. That works. You can do whatever you want. You guys, this is, <laughs> I won't call on anybody else then. And tell that you give talks about it. <laughs> I did that last week. Well, this is this one. I, I'm, I'm a retired physician and I give presentations uh, about medical aid and dying to some lay groups. And in fact, I'm giving a talk in two weeks to the um, senior facility that we live in. And so oh, nice. I'm, just, I'm just getting updated. Yeah. <laughs> I actually we talked have... to Karen Morin on the telephone a couple of days ago about the, which hospices are supportive and which are not. So I'm very interested to hear her talk later this morning. Yeah, we also have materials too, if you don't know, if you didn't I, I know just, that. Yeah, I, I've got them. I just got a, uh, okay. I just got a packet sent to me by Leslie of brochures and uh, that I'm going to be passing out. Okay, great. Yeah, just want to make sure you're ready. So, <laughs> am I? Am I on? Am I off talking? Am I on? No, nope, I can hear you. I can mute okay. you, though, Dolores. Can I ask you a question? You know about yeah. um, that um, healthcare facilities are supposed to put their uh, policy on medical aid and dying on the website. Mm -hmm. You know that, right? At least yep. in California, yeah. Well, I've been checking and, and it, only like um, uh, Kaiser has done that. UC Davis has done that. The big medical centers have done that. But if you go into the hospices, you can't, nobody's doing it. There's nothing yeah, on their websites. So there's no, that's a great idea because it helps you choose where you may want to go. But if they don't do it and nobody's enforcing it, what good is it? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so that's definitely nobody's... something I think we want to um, address when we go back to try to get the law reauthorized because there isn't any teeth behind that. Yeah. Um, so you can or cannot do it, you know, if you don't. But also, I think a lot of people don't know that that even was part of the law. So yeah. it's, been, it's well, been challenging. No, yeah, you're right. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Nika, let's hop into um, Zena. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zena Regis, 
And I am the Director of Faith Engagement at Compassion and Choices. And I'm so happy to be with you. I was in the breakout group with Barbara and said I was crashing your California statewide conference because I am, uh, I currently live in Georgia, but I was born in California in Sacramento. Um, and that's where a lot of my family lives. And so I love any opportunity to get to California. I was just in San Francisco um, a couple of weeks ago and I'll be in San Diego for a Presbyterian conference where I'll be presenting on um, end of life choice. So, so happy to be with you. Um, so I just wanna start with the good news. Nico, we can go to the next slide. Um, um, that one of the comments that I get a lot when I am presenting about uh, faith, um, faith issues or actually not presenting, but just sending out emails or social media posts is people say, why are we doing so much at Compassion and Choices around faith? It is, it's the religious people who are against our movement. And what we are finding is that that's not true. 67% um, of people of all faiths support medical aid and dying. And th we have the breakdown, 70% of Catholics, 59% of Christians, of all Christians, 53% uh, of Protestants, 70% of people in other religions. So we have a lot of support um, among um, in our faith community. And so really harnessing that support has been so important. Even people um, who have across levels of observance, 55% um, of people who attend church weekly support medical aid and dying, 76% who attend um, church monthly and 82% who attend church seldom seldomly or never. Um, and so what I'm finding that is that those numbers are just going up. The more that we educate um, people about um, our movement, the more those numbers go up because often it is um, just simply people who don't know or who have been misinformed. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And so as part of that, we have a Faith Leaders for Compassion group. We, um, and the goals there are to empower faith leaders to best serve their congregants as they face end of life and to recruit and prepare other faith, leader, faith leaders to present workshops, provide legislative testimonies, conduct meetings with policymakers and community leaders. And what we really have found is that so many people want this information um, because often people go to their faith communities before they go anywhere else to talk through these things. And so, Empowering faith leaders to really have all the resources that they can to have these conversations has been such a huge part of my work. And so I'm so grateful uh, for the Faith Leaders for Compassion who um, really are always talking about these issues. We just had a, uh, an event last night in Illinois where it was a group, a panel of diverse faith leaders talked about how they theologically talk about these issues. If somebody says, you know, life is sacred, so that's why I don't support medical aid and dying, or only God can take and give life, um, so that's why I don't support MAID. Um, how people are able to respond and really talk about their theology. So our Faith Leaders for Compassion do a lot, a little bit of everything. Um, write opinion pieces, attend a lot of faith-related and community-based conferences, um, speak about end-of-life issues, provide education and support to other faith leaders on an individual basis. And I have just really been surprised by how I've been in this role for, for exactly two years, um, two years this month, and I've just been amazed by how open so many faith communities are to talk about these issues. Nico, we can go to the next slide. And so this is what I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've learned about in these two years that we've been had a had a position dedicated to faith outreach. Um, that first and informed, and here goes my door. Um, I hope my dogs aren't doing too much. I am going to close my door. I'm so. back. My apologies. Um, but that an informed and engaged network of clergy and faith community speaking about these issues is vital to our movement. So often we let one voice kind of dominate the conversation about faith and religion um, when it comes to these type of issues. 
Um, and so having an informed and engaged network of clergy who are able to speak to these issues has been so vital for our movement. So often I'll have people reach out to me and say, is there a faith leader in this state or in this community that can speak to these issues? And that's been so important, um, especially letting people know that there is just not, it's, there's a diversity of diversity of folks who support end of life choice. Um, the, the second thing we found is that most faith communities welcome tools and programs and resources about advanced care planning and end of life conversations. And so what I find often is that people will come to me and be like, I don't think my church is ready to talk about this, or I don't think my synagogue will um, appreciate a conversation about this. But we have found kind of an entry point is advanced care planning and just end of life conversation generally. Um, and so that's where I start with a lot of faith communities is just talking about, um, you know, how have, what is an advanced directive? Who's your healthcare proxy? How are, how do we have these conversations? And I very rarely have a faith community say, don't come in and talk about this. Um, and then I'm able to work and work and talk about end of life options and end of life choice and medical aid and dying because we've laid the groundwork um, which is end of life conversations. And then the last piece is that there really have to be open and honest conversations about medical aid and dying within faith spaces because often I will go armed with my like counter points like this is what the opposition is going to say and this is what I, I need to say. And so often what I find is that it's just misinformation. So I really don't even have to have counterparts. I just have to really talk about the legislation as it is. I have to talk about the safeguards. Um, and people are like, oh, I didn't realize that. Or they just realize that they have had misinformation about the law um, or just about the movement in general. And so that has been a huge part um, of my work is just countering this misinformation and giving people space for strong feelings. Um, I recently, um, just in Houston this weekend, I did a talk on spiritual care and medical aid and dying and what does it look like for clergy and chaplains to provide spiritual care, both for people who are using medical aid and dying and support for their families. Um, and that was just such a, a great place. And I had a woman who actually lives in California um, tell me that her mother used MAID um, and she said, like, there were just so many spaces where I couldn't go to talk about it. I loved um, that Angela spoke to um, the, you know, more preparation groups and more um, bereavement groups. But we just had a wonderful open conversation in that space about kind of the misinformation. I mean, just the attitude she faced um, and how she didn't get a lot of grief support. By but by her experience, she's been able to share with people and support people going through it. And so that has been such a huge part of our work in the faith space is just making space to have these conversations and really elevating voices within these different communities to talk. Um, very quickly, I, um, I don't wanna make sure I don't take up too much time, but we also, we have a Catholics for Compassion initiative. Um, and so it's a group of really engaged um, Catholics who are doing a lot of work around these issues and trying to um, just spread information about this in their faith. And so that has been a wonderful group um, that we've um, just initiated. And so look for more information about some upcoming events that they are doing. We are also starting a Jewish Leaders for Compassion group um, to talk about these issues because there's been a lot of interest um, among our Jewish supporters about how do we talk about this in Jewish communities. Um, and so we've had, it's been a very, very energized group to talk about that. And so we welcome uh, more and more voices to talk about these issues. We realize that faith can be a tricky topic, but it's also a really, really diverse um, and rewarding and enriching topic. Um, around these issues. And so if you are interested in learning about um, more about it, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Or if you would like a presentation at one of your congregations, please let me know and I'll um, coordinate with this team to do that. And I know we have a little time for questions if, if people have any questions. I didn't oh, see Melissa. any questions. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, no, I just love uh, Melissa's comment. Um, yes, I love that, Melissa. And if you ever need any resources or support, please, this is exactly what I love to do. We're working with some Muslim communities here in Georgia 
um, to start conversations um, around end of life planning. All right, thank you so much, Zena. We had a lot of requests to have uh, this topic, so appreciate you joining us. So glad to be here. All right, uh, next. Yeah. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. The bereavement group. Who are they? So next, we're going to have uh, Mitz and Marsha are going to talk about death talk. And this is going to be like a death talk. So take it away, Mitz. Thank you, Angela. Uh, my name's Mitsuo Tomita. I go by Mitz. I'm a retired family practice physician. Uh, my career is at Kaiser here in San Diego. Um, and a number of years ago, I was co, and I still am co-hosting uh, a death cafe with Frank. Frank's a 93-year-old retired uh, Navy uh, officer. And um, the two of us have enjoyed doing these death cafes, but um, the rules of the death cafes is that there's no agenda. And I wanted to have something that had an agenda. So as a spinoff from the death cafes, I started these San Diego death talk meetups. And, you know, to join meetup, you go and sign up. And then you, there's a whole menu of different things, hiking groups and 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 uh, dining groups and et cetera. And when I said, I want to start a death talk meetup, there was a bit of a pause, but they approved it. And so for the last couple of years, I've been hosting these um, virtual death talk meetups where people come in and talk about their hospice or this, that, or the others. And again, I'm grateful that Compassion Choices has, has uh, taken care of the about $200 to have a, a, a meetup group. So over the last uh, few years, uh, we've had uh, a, a variety of people briefly talk about uh, things like the local medical schools talked about um, the medical school's body donation program. Uh, we've had local mortuaries and cemeteries talk about common things they wish people knew ahead of time and answer questions. Uh, we've had uh, the county office talk about burials for uh, indigent persons. San Diego does have a potter's field. Um, we've had um, emergency department physicians talk about dying in the ER or ICU nurses talking about dying in the ICU. Uh, geriatricians talk about progressive frailty and things like sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass uh, as part of the aging process. But with that weakness and falls, uh, recently had a talk about alkaline hydrolysis or liquid cream acclimation, I guess they call it, which is instead of flame cremation, uh, the body is dissolved in a um, alkaline uh, solution. Uh, we've had talks on fiduciaries and conservatorships, anyway, Roddy's talks. And so uh, now I have over 880 members of the Death Talk meetups. Um, we usually have about 30 to 40 people attend. Uh, we recently had a talk by uh, an end of life doula, uh, another one who is an author of a book entitled how to make dying easy, and then in parenthesis, er, how to make dying easy, in parenthesis, er. Um, and um, we'll be featuring in May um, uh, Lisa Paul, who's a social worker. She works in the emergency department hospice, and she'll be talking about her uh, death deck. And in June, uh, Marsha uh, Sloan will be speaking, of, well, will be speaking next about her story about, about her, her mother using Visa. I have a neurointensivist in the queue talking about brain injury in the ICU and management and decisions around that. And anyway, there's there's been a lot of interest, much more than I expected. So that, that's basically what I'm I'm doing. And uh, we'll we're open to questions either now or or, or later. I, I have a question because it's a San Diego death talk. Is it open to other people in California? Oh, it's open to anyone throughout the country. I'm, so, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, so if you Google, well, sign up for, for, for the meetup, and then there's a whole menu of things. Uh, and so San Diego 
Death Talk Meetup is open, uh, and we have people from the East Coast and all over the place that uh, attend these meetings. And I'll send, we'll send a link out too in the follow-up email in case people want to get into the meetup. Great. Thank you very much. So I, I believe that I'm, um, as we have a, a Deaf Talk-like uh, experience today, I'm the invited guest and um, I'm Marcia Sloan and I live in Mendocino on the North Coast and it's a pleasure to be with you today. I became a storyteller for Compassion and Choices because my mom at the age of 98 chose to voluntarily stop eating and drinking. And my husband Todd and I were her caregivers through her dying process. And this experience got me to think about the fact that someday I too will make this passage. <clears throat> so I kept a journal of my mom's VSED week. VSED is the acronym for voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about her experience. And uh, Nico, maybe for the my mom's story, you can bring bring the picture back to to me. Great picture of my mother and I there on Kiji Island. <laughs> my mom's name was Opal Sloan and she was born in 1918. She was practical, organized, curious about people and places and always interested in learning new skills and expanding her horizons. And the way she planned her death was entirely in keeping with how she lived her life. In her late 80s and early 90s, my mom said many times she did not want to keep living if mental or physical challenges compromised the quality of her life or made her unable to choose how and when she wanted to die. And at the senior residence where she lived, she joined a meditation group, she read about death and dying, and took advantage of the resources available through Compassion and Choices all leading to her decision that when she felt it was her time, she would voluntarily stop eating and drinking. In her late 90s, she started having more physical challenges. <clears throat> Carpal tunnel syndrome made using her computer and holding her fork more difficult. Her appetite was decreasing, her weight was dropping, and she could see that soon she wouldn't be able to leave her apartment. So it was not a surprise when at the age of 98, she announced it was time. My father had died 27 years prior and I was her only child. And my husband Todd and I were on board to help her die the way she wanted. <clears throat> we set her V said start date for three months down the road, which gave my mom time to finalize her affairs and get organized for her V said journey. For her memorial announcement, she wrote, uh, I have lived a long and happy life and feel I've come to the end of it. I'm thinking of my passing as a new adventure, wondering what will happen. She'd recently seen her doctor who had written her a diagnosis of failure to thrive. And when she asked him about VSET and how long the process usually takes, he estimated two weeks to a month, perhaps less for her. As it turned out, my mother's visa journey took seven days. She did not have a, term, a six month terminal diagnosis and the local hospice could not provide care because of that. But she had the round the clock care she needed from me, my husband and several relief caregivers. She had the support of the nurse at her facility and the commitment of her doctor who prescribed sedation and anti-anxiety medications and signed the death certificate after she died. And most importantly, my mother had the strength of her own resolve. On her first day of VSED, my mom said that for several days prior, she had been eating less and not missing food. She said, I'm telling myself I don't need food and I don't need this world. And that day we enjoyed looking through family photos. 
On day two, she experienced dry heaving, after which she felt better and slept and rested. And on day three, she seemed back to her old self and she was concerned with whether her cable TV provider had discontinued her service. And I played music CDs and she especially enjoyed slow, spacious piano without a regular beat. And several days later, I played my cello for her as she drifted off to sleep. In the course of the week, Mom came up with several hand signs in the event she could no longer speak, signals for yes or no, and tracing her mouth with her finger when she needed her lips moistened. On the evening of the sixth day, eyes closed, she traced her lips for the last time, and the next morning she took her last breath. <clears throat> Before she undertook the VSED process, I, I couldn't imagine that anyone could dictate their death so much on their own terms, but she did it. And from how she described what was happening to her that week, dying felt no better or worse than how we sometimes feel in the midst of life. <clears throat> I deeply admire my mother's courage and appreciate that I could witness the preparation, the clarity and fearless resolve that marked her choice. I see that knowing she could be said when she was ready was tremendously empowering and reassuring for her. I came away from my mother's v said week less in denial about my mortality, less afraid of the death of my physical body, and more interested in thinking about how to prepare so I'll feel ready when it's time. We may not all have the experience my mother did, but her story encourages me to think about my death with the same curiosity and openness with which I think about my life. And I hope her story can help others do that as well. My mom's journal is posted on the uh, Compassion and Choices website, and I'll put the link in the chat. Next slide. In the couple of uh, last couple of years uh, since my mom died in 2017, uh, I've shared my mom's story in several Compassion and Choices webinars. And Angela, I want to thank you for the, opportun the opportunity to learn more about VSED and include some information here about VSED, which is highlighted by my mom's story. Uh, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is a patient-directed approach to dying. It's a, con a conscious decision to refuse foods and fluids of any kind to allow a death consistent with the body's natural dying process. It's a legal end-of-life option available in all 50 states for people over the age of 18 with mental capacity. V said can bring reassurance of an end to suffering for someone with a terminal illness or a, chronicle, in, a chronic or incurable disorder, or as for my mother, it can bring a peaceful end to a long, well-lived life. A person decides for themselves when they will begin VSED. And if at some point after beginning the process, they reconsider their decision and decide to resume eating or drinking, caregivers must honor that choice. The VSED process, the dying process, will be different for everyone based on many factors, including age, physical condition, and readiness for letting go. Next slide. For my mother, her advance planning contributed to that readiness. She had communicated her intention to be said to me and my husband long before the time came. In her last months, she spoke with her doctor about be said. She completed her financial and business affairs. We rented a hospital bed and bought the supplies she'd need at her bedside. She spoke with her friends about her readiness to arrive at life's end, and we planned the memorial at her senior residence. Next slide. Advanced planning involves communication 
with family, friends, physician, care facility, hospice. A person cannot be said alone. They will want to discuss their wishes with their family and loved ones. For someone residing in a care facility, they will want to discuss their wishes with the nursing director to make sure they have their support. Many hospices support VSED, but it's good to call the hospices in your area to see whether they would support VSED. VSED is legal, but not every institution is supportive of this choice. Nor can the VSED process be undertaken alone. Once the dying process has begun, a person needs 24 hour support from a team of family, friends, or paid caregivers. They need ongoing hospice care or oversight by their physician. And to help coordinate the process, many choose the services and support of an end of life doula. Next slide. How long the VSET process takes will be different for everyone, but whether we're the person who's going to VSET or on that person's care team, thinking in advance about how to make this time meaningful is important along with all the other practical considerations. How do we want our last days to be? Do we want to listen to music, have fresh flowers, have visits with a chaplain, read or be read to, watch favorite movies, look through photo albums, spend time with loved ones, or keep a journal of this experience to, to share with others. Next slide. I found the time <laughs> with my mom. <laughs> oh gosh. She died, uh, let's see, in 2017, seven years later. I, d I found the time with my mom during her VSET week to be very poignant. She'd taken care of her affairs, she felt at peace, and that week turned out to be as much about living as it was about dying. Our conversations ranged from mundane to funny to riveting, and my mom, my husband, and I had a beautiful opportunity to appreciate the years we had together and say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Marsha. I didn't see any questions in the chat, but if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put it in and we can ask Marsha. And Marsha, I just, all, again, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your mom's story. I know um, it can be difficult. So you do such a beautiful job of doing it. So. We will share um, the link to, to your, your journal for your mom. That will also be in the follow-up email um, so that everyone can read it. And I've told Marsha, um, I am a runner. I'm a long distance runner, so I'm always hungry. And really reading her, mom, her journaling about her mom's story made me really kind of understand that this can be such a meaningful experience. And I've since talked to several other people who have had a loved one go through the voluntary stop eating and drinking process and just said like how wonderful it was that they were all able to, you know, get on the bed together and be with each other through that last couple of days. Um, somebody did ask, how did medical physicians support your mom's end of life care? Do you want to answer that, Marcia? Yeah. Um, the doctor, my mother's doctor, who had seen my mom, you know, within four months or so, four or five months before she decided to be said, wrote the needed prescriptions uh, for the anti anxiety medications and then for um, morphine. And uh, the nurse at her care facility um, helped with the visit, you know, with the communication with the doctor and we picked up the prescriptions. And so he he made it all possible, uh, really, because he that well, the two of them were huge support to us. Um, and I think those, you know, that support could also come from hospice. Uh, be, be, but because my mother did not have a terminal diagnosis 
And I, d I do understand now that people without a terminal diagnosis, if they undertake visa several days into their process, they may qualify then for, for hospice. But my mother, I mean, she was a sturdy little thing. And, you know, they, the hospice came back two days later and she still, her, her readings were not within the realm where they could activate hospice. So then the weekend came and she died on a Tuesday morning the following week. It was a pretty amazing experience. And um, I feel, and it isn't so hard to share it. It's just that things come up when I think about it that will always be there. So in some ways I'm very grateful to, I'm very grateful to be able to, to share my mom's story. <laughs> Thanks so much, Marsha. I didn't see any other questions, just a lot of people thanking you for sharing um, your story and looking forward to reading the journal. So um, thank you again, Marsha. I love hearing your story over and over again. Um, we, <laughs> I do. I just, um, we can move on now to Karen Warren. So I can't unmute myself. Am I? Hi, I'm trying to figure out whether I'm unmuted myself or not. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> All right. All right. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your mom's story. That was that was lovely. It really, really was. And this whole program, the last few weeks, have just been very enlightening. So thank you for putting this together. Um, we can move on from my information. Thank you. You know, all of us come here to this death work, and I don't know how else you describe it when you're at a cocktail party and someone asks, what do you do? But you know, we have our combination of professional experiences and our personal journey that have brought us to this work. And I've worked in hospitals since high school and I've worked as an RN in clinical settings from AIDS to oncology to almost a decade in hospice. And my experience in hospice and oncology has really driven the way I've looked at medical aid in dying. And we've seen so many patients, including my own husband, that really would have loved to have the access to MAID. And the big issue has always been finding that access, finding that doctor who would help them uh, get the kind of death that they were really looking for. Uh, next slide. So. After the law was passed in 2016, where were we? What did we really uh, have at that point? Um, as we used to say in our CNC PowerPoints, it was one thing to have a law, another thing to be able to access it and use the law. But everybody knew we had medical marijuana in California. There was no worry about that. Um, the rollout for the large institutions was bumpy to say the least. We were still, there were meetings and there were announcements, but the majority of clinicians, doctors and nurses were not aware of medical aid and dying. And we still were getting many calls within the system of UCLA or Kaiser to name a couple, um, don't mean to exclude Northern California, okay, UC San Francisco, asking how to access the law. And what do we do? Can you help us get to a doctor? We've asked and gotten nowhere. So they were first out of the gate, but they seemed to be stuck in the garden for a little bit. And too many patients were, were dying or suffering and doctors were canceling. At that point, Compassion Choices had this end of life consultant program. I know they still call it end of life consultants, but there were a group of trained volunteers, both in Northern California and Southern California that I was a part of. It was rewarding and frustrating work. We would be matched to a patient who was desperate to find a doctor. And we were then trying to help them navigate the system, so to speak. CNC disbanded this group, um, the out outreach group and turned its focus on the major lawsuits. There were a number of different advocacy groups that were formed to fill that vo void. But as we were soon to see with hospices that were populating all over the state, 
Not all were the same and not all were filled with people who found these issues and were not always filled with compassionate and empathetic people. Many of the volunteers that were involved in helping to get the law passed were still continuing to do outreach and education wherever they could. But the challenges, next slide, was also um, information. And it continued to be, that's, isn't that, that's the great picture. We were all like slapping our heads at what we were seeing and what patients were telling us. The lack of uh, awareness and education that the End of Life Option Act or death with dignity, as many people knew it, were really a law here in California. And we get that even today. What did the law mean? Was it an injection? Was it a pill? What, what was it really about? Um, we were hearing again the struggles, the frustration of the families who were trying to get this for their family. Um, some of the anger and grief that we see now and doing the bereavement groups that we do, it's a big part of this delayed grief process that's going on that how, how difficult it was to navigate this and just get some simple answers about how to access medical aid and dying. Even in palliative care, this misinformation persists. One of my most recent patient families explained their frustration and getting medical aid and dying for their dad. They had been asking for weeks um, while he was an inpatient at a Southern California hospital, neither the clinical nurses, the doctors, the residents, the care managers, the discharge planners would give them any information. Even when referred to palliative care, the doctor there alluded that either he didn't know or it was something that he really couldn't talk about while, while the patient was in palliative care. I'm thrilled we have this great emergency room palliative partnership, but we need to enlighten more doctors about what uh, medical aid and dying is. So it was one of those early um, uh, days that we were doing talks that I was focusing on trying to talk a hospice nurse to hospice about what medical aid and dying really was. Um, I found one of my early talks, we did a, a conversation at an in-service. I'd go when they had their in-service meetings once a week. We talked, we found a doctor there that was willing to prescribe or was open to it. And a few weeks later, we had a patient with liver metastases um, who was had been looking for a while to find a place that he could land to get medical aid and die called up this doctor and sure enough, it was a go. And we found the first hospice that would be willing to prescribe in Los Angeles. So I continue to focus on hospices and getting in and speaking to hospices and explaining how they could benefit their patients, how to access medical aid and dying. We continue to get patient calls and referrals from a number of different sources based on the talks we were doing. But it came down to two issues. One, we either, we helped them get to a hospice that would provide medical aid and dying, or they stayed on the hospice where they were. And many were so sick, uh, going doctor to doctor, visit these places were, was just impossible. And one of the best things that came out of COVID was this growing acceptance of telemedicine. Many of the patients that were saying when they were asking for medical aid and dying, even when they were able to discuss it with their primary medical doctor, they were always told, oh, we'll refer you to hospice. And they got a name of a hospice. Now, again, these medical doctors, we never knew if they even knew if the hospice they were referring to supported medical aid and dying or not. Take UCLA, look at their extensive website on um, medical aid and dying. It goes into how to think about it, how to discuss it with your family, all the different issues. At the very end, you'll get a little blurb on hospices and it mentions maybe four, maybe there's five there now. Almost all of them won't even discuss medical aid and dying. Only one will um, consider themselves supportive. So it, it's a, continues to be big issue today in 2024. Next slide. So the clinical education gaps 
are still there. And we all know some of the things that patients have told us, oh, you've got to go to ethics committee to get that. Or there isn't any hospices in LA that offer, or San Francisco for that matter. Right now, I think there's five in LA that we're referring to. You, you need a special course, the doctor would say, and I don't have time to get that information. Or the hospice says, okay, I had one patient recently who called three hospices. He had a whole list of questions I had given him. And so he knew right away where he wanted to go. And then every two weeks they were repeating, oh yeah, we'll help you with that. We'll help you with that. And the very end they said, oh, we'll get you to the social worker. Next slide. So as we were beginning to uh, take some patients in, what was really the impetus to form LA Patient Advocate? So in 2022, the big change, and I know in the uh, movie that we mentioned, it really focuses a lot on the 15 days. But what we were seeing was patients were desperate to get the medication. The time went from 15 to 48 hours. And often as I walked in the room, it's like, what? You don't have the medicine with you? Uh, so next slide. So we, at that point that we, there still was a huge gap between the education process, between medicine and nursing and the referrals to patients. And at this point, all we could do was really refer them to hospice. It was in February, right after the update of the law that I got a call from CNC about a volunteer who was now in hospice. Despite coming from UCLA and voicing his definitive desire to use MAID, he was ending up, he ended up in one of the biggest hospices in LA that refused to discuss medical aid and dying. The week before I had called and spoken to a couple of the doctors that I was often working with because one of the issues I was coming across was often I had patients that didn't want to change hospice. They loved their nurse. They already had all this equipment. What were they going to It seemed like such an overwhelming task to think about changing hospices. So how do we address the needs of those patients? So I talked to doctors about, can we go ahead and provide medical aid and dying for those patients? So we got a plan in place, sort of, but now we had patients that were really in need. So I'd met with the patient and his wife. They'd both been vocal supporters and, and she is a storyteller to this day. When we first got there, the patient was in so much pain uh, and she had said that, oh, that they had said, they give him more pain medicine, um, it could kill him. That was the first thing. So that was the, also the introduction to pain management. It is so very, very important. And we, I know hospice nurses go in and teach and educate about pain management, but there's such a misconception in this country not right now about pain management, morphine, what does it do, how is it important? And many patients feel like they have to be suffering or they're not gonna qualify. So that's always the first thing we do is address, why are you asking for medical aid and dying at this point? And is your pain being properly managed? And we find that we have to do this re-education each time. But hey, we're nurses, we educate. That's our main goal. So we went in, got the doctor on the phone. We got a new plan for pain management. The doctor was able to contact the hospice physician and we got things in place. And we went over the fees for the doctors, the consulting and the prescribing and for the medication, and we got that uh, taken care of. And at that point, um, we returned for the second call. We're there with the patient and the family for the second call. Of course, it was a weekend. I seem to get all my patients on the weekends, but we were able to get the medication delivered on Monday morning, and he ingested about that time. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about hospices and um, what they do and what they don't do, but that's a really important point. What does supportive and what does prescribing mean? Next slide. So some of the issues we were, um, that's the slide I was thinking. Some of the issues we were, um, that's all right, go to the one about the, um, supportive. One of the things we're thinking of at this point, so we're 
doing an ingestion. We have the chaplain there, but the chaplain leaves the room. And, and imagine, you know, you've gotten to this point, death is now in, intimate. The, um, the nurses you work with, the chaplain, they're all going to leave. So what does this say to the patient and the patient's family about medical aid and dying, about this death that's about to take place? So we spend a lot of time in preparation and answering questions and prepare them for every single thing that's going to happen that day, how long it's going to take, what they'll experience it, and who they want to be present. You know, we really spend a lot of time in feeling like, yes, we'll mix the medication, we'll prepare the glass. Yes, we can hold the glass, we'll help to direct, um, offer a couple different ways for them to take the medication, uh, either with a straw, or I find often that patients just want to do the, do the chug thing, that they're very motivated. Um, but supportive and prescribing, yeah, I, again, I will challenge you to go on some of these websites and find out uh, what that really means and what they're saying. Even the largest uh, hospice in LA, I, you can get through probably about 20 pages where you get to their policy on medical aid and dying. Uh, next slide. So the issues that we were, and when it comes to supporting and prescribing, no, we're gonna, you know, it was backwards, you gotta go the other direction. Thanks, a couple more. So we've had a number um, of, surveys on hospices, supportive versus prescribing. And I think the problem with those surveys is that, you know, who's answering the phone and what and how they define supportive versus prescribing. Uh, so it, we do need at this point to go back and have an understanding of what that means and how we're, okay, now I'm getting dizzy, and how we're going to work with those hospices and how we uh, send our patients to hospices and how we have them evaluate them. So the other issues that we continue to see, um, oh, I did want to talk about, okay, so that February night and with that first patient is how LA Patient Advocates really was formed. You were at the right side. So our goal is to connect patients and doctors who are willing to participate in aid and dying process. We facilitate the communication and coordination between patients, thank you, healthcare providers to ensure a smooth and supportive experience. If this is extends to the hospice and probably 90% of our patients come through hospice referrals. Um, we want patients to be able to stay in the hospice they're comfortable with and get medical aid in dying. Um, I had an instance where I had a, director of nursing of a couple of hospices called me, asked me a number of questions about what we did and how we did, how we did it, what doctor, what pharmacy. So we went through the whole thing and I was like, oh, okay, all right, all right, we'll, we'll get back to you. And then it was like, oh, um, I said, well, I'd be glad to come in and do a talk and explain to the nurses you know, what the process is. No, no, I think, I think we got it. And of course, the next day we get a phone call and they said, no, we'd prefer just to send all of our patients to you. So at this point, we're probably working with four or five patients a month. Uh, right now I have uh, four patients that have the medication or actually we get the medication and we keep it on site here where our nurses have access to it in the safe. Um, and we get the medical records. I uh, usually get a face sheet, an h &P from the hospice, send that to our physicians. We have five physicians right now that we can use for both consulting and prescribing. And as nurses, we're able to go in and highlight what we're finding with the patient in terms of diagnosis. And we can work with the patients and the family in terms of what to expect, what the next uh, steps are assess nausea and vomiting, swallowing the gut, what condition is the gut is and how important and you know just help in general. So right now there's about um, 12, maybe 13 different hospices that are referring to us. We have uh, two nurses and I'm actually um, probably bringing out a third nurse um, 
uh, tomorrow meeting with them. So, um, and it's been good because we are available. All these doctors, all these nurses are great. We're available on the weekend. So again, I find that patients are just so desperate and they've been looking and searching so long when they finally get to us, we're able to make it happen usually work within the 48 hours or three to five days. So patients are able to access it um, medical aid and dying when they want. We stay in contact with the hospice all through the day of ingestion. Usually we text the nurse or the care manager, but nine times out of 10, the, as, a nurse, as an RN, I can pronounce the patient and I'll work with the family during that bereavement and I'll usually destroy any meds on site and, you know, Oftentimes hospitals say, well, we already have an RN there. Why pay for another one? So, um, and we continue to do staff education and in-services. Many of the hospices I'm going with, I, I go quarterly to talk to the staff as they come in and out. Um, so, um, cost, we've been really, we work very hard to keep a very lean operation here. Um, there are a number of physician groups that are also doing this, but we um, have been able to keep it really just above what, um, what our services are. Medicare doesn't provide or private insurance, and that's why a lot of our families, it's important that we're very open on the very first visit, that what we have to pay our doctors and what the meds. We surveyed all the pharmacy. We have a great pharmacy now that fills it right away for only... $380. So that's been um, a big, big encouragement. And we have a lot of new doctors that have been working with us. So that's good. People that want to get involved in there. I know I'm running out of time. So um, we work with Medi-Cal and getting a patient who's on Medi-Cal into a, a hospice and whether they're in a boarding care or an assisted living facility, We've worked in all kinds of facilities. And I, I, I know Angela mentioned the um, PIN, the uh, social services notes that have gone out. I actually use that with talk with the family about whether they're gonna let the um, uh, facility know or not. I let them know that they have a right to privacy and they don't have to tell them. Um, I've actually had patients that we haven't told the facility at all. The patient was on hospice, the patient has gotten very ill, and the patient died. Or the other way, you know, you have a patient who's gotten med ready to use medical aid, dying, playing cards, and telling everybody he's not going to be here next week. So there, there's a middle line in there, too. So we're working with all of them. So right now, we had a patient yesterday who died in a facility, and I've worked with the facility twice before, and we already have an in-service set up for next week for the staff. Because many times these patients have been there, you know, weeks, months, they have um, a connection with the staff members, and there's a lot of talk and questions about the law. So I'm really thrilled to be able to go back in. So we're following up at these facilities and say, let us come back in and talk to the staff. If not talk to the whole community, talk to the staff so they know how to respond when, when uh, the residents are asking. The other big issue we run into is language. Um, the biggest language and cultural barriers are um, Russian and Spanish lately. Um, I, mean, I, I worked for years at Cedar sinai so I had a lot of population of Holocaust survivors and Russian language speaking. So again, it goes back to not only the language and documentation. We take care of all the documentation and all the forms that go into the CD. Um, public Department of Public Health, also making sure that the interpreters, we like to use, if a family member is interpreting, I like to use a different interpreter for both different telemedicine. So we know things are being explained in different ways and we're getting feedback from other language speakers at, at that point. And again, um, going back to the large institutions, next slide to see where we are here. Um, the institutions were still finding that um, even though the um, uh, procedures have gone, um, that large institutions are still looking at 15 days and two weeks. So I get a lot of patients that call us 
and end up wanting to use us because we can move things through the system a lot faster. It's not as burdensome as some of the large institutions. Um, I think that I think I've covered everything in all these pages and pages of uh, of notes that I have here. The other big um, issue that we run into is, um, I think it's on the next slide, but the reporting, not only are we reporting in California um, uh, Department of Public Health, but it's after the patient is pronounced, we call the mortuary. Well, everywhere else you're calling the mortuary, you're saying that you're a hospice nurse and the patient's died at home. But there's some counties where you've got to call the coroner. And I had an instance the other day where the question was, oh, well, was there any evidence of assisted suicide? And the nurse and I looked at each other like, oh, you know, because, you know, it's 2024. We're, we're not using that language anymore. And so anyway, so there is, we need to work better about getting, um, you can go down to the last slide, the advocating. Um, so it's the uneven application of the law. So reflecting on the journey of advocating for patient autonomy and end of life options, we want to emphasize the importance of collective efforts in fostering uh, compassionate and communicative care. We're all committed to continued advocacy and improving this whole process and all these numbers of steps, provide access to information availability of services. I think we need to continue to improve our, our listing of hospices and what the steps and, and the continued education of clinicians, residents, physicians, smaller hospital systems. Recently, we had a, a patient whose husband died. She went back to her dermatologist. And again, it was, oh, that's not a law in California, the shocked actual physician that people are still shocked. We need to commit to maintaining the ability to use telemedicine, both to accommodate dying patients and their schedules, but also for pain medication for dying patients. Our political partners, we need to uh, continue to make that bridge. So we're updates on law and reporting and establish a reliable system for reporting those that are not within the law. I've had times where I've gone into facilities and both myself and the family members have been accosted um, by the facility for what we were attempting to do with the patient. That patient, we actually moved out of that facility to a board and care, and he never took the medical aid and dying drug. But we need to do better, and we can do better. And I know with all of us there, we will do better. Uh, continue to educate for the alphabet soup of facilities continue to support our conferences, um, ACMAID, the nursing and doula groups, and other patient advocate groups. So thank you again for allowing me time to say my piece here and appreciate any questions you might have. Thanks, Karen. Um, you're so knowledgeable. There are two questions. Um, that I see so far. So um, one question was, is it a standard prescription? Is it the same for everyone? Yeah, it's pretty much standard now. We call it DDMAPH. So it's a combination of drugs. So I, I didn't get to say that. So the patient within, oh, four, I always say three to five minutes. It's really three to 10 minutes, depending on whether you're using the oral or rectal. We can use oral, we can use a feeding tube, or we can use rectal. But in each of those areas, it's the patient who begins the administration. So if it's a feeding tube or rectal, we fasten a tube and a large uh, syringe that the patient has to use. And often if we know we're gonna use the rectal route, I'll leave a big syringe there with the patient, maybe put a little bit of oil in the um, stopper and let them practice. So they know, we talk a lot about this window of opportunity that as patient continues to decline and their strength is going, that we want them to be able to have the strength to either push the plunger or to be able to drink the medication. So we talk about this powder that we reconstitute with some apple juice or water. And they all everybody wants to know, and you have to say it over and over again, how what's the volume and what's the thickness so that they can practice uh, during the lead up to the ingestion day. 
and they can feel comfortable knowing that they're going to be able to swallow it. Thank you. And then another question is, do you only work with people in LA or all over California? No, I just say I live alone. I have an electric car, so I go all over. <laughs> so I'll go wherever. Yes, we we go as far south as, well, now there's three of us. So we could go all over uh, Southern California down to San Diego. But yes, I've been known to go to Northern California. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Karen. And now we... Um... We just have one last breakout room. If um, Nico, you can set that up. If you all just want to get together, if there was something that, um, you know, really caught your attention today, if you can think about, you know, if there's a way that you can get more involved in compassion and choices, even if it's just educating yourself more so that you can have a better end of life experience, um, you know, however you want to get involved and help try to grow the movement. And if there's ideas too about how we can make improvements to the law, like I said, we have to go back and get it reauthorized. So Nico, go ahead and enter the breakout room. I'll add um, Karen's contact information in the follow-up email too. Okay, thanks. For this one, I also did five. Is that okay? Five minutes? If not, I can do it sooner. Oh, you're mute. Sorry. Yeah, you can bring it back at 29 after. 29. Okay. Nico, is everyone back from the breakout room? I'm uh, not cool. Uh, no, it, they're closing now. So okay. Oh, we needed more time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I, I want to just say something real quick, if I can, Rose. Yeah. Uh, you, you were you were starting to say something, and it might be something to pose to Angela or others offline if you're comfortable, but. Um, just about the the the, the registry related uh, comment you got cut off on. She's muted, but um, I don't mean to like you know out somebody. <laughs> just we, there was a comment. There was a comment made uh, regarding the fact that if you're requesting um, uh, medical aid and dying, you may be subject to being put on a registry or some of some sort. Is that anything anybody has heard of or knows about? No, I'm looking at Karen more. <laughs> like, 
Do you want to respond? Yeah, it's always a depression question. You know, there's always, when, when you look at the forms that the doctors have to fill out, and I send my doctors a list of the questions so they know they've checked them off. And we've always, as nurses, have gone through those questions. So the depression is a thing that, you know, are you depressed? Well, if you have cancer and you've been in treatment for seven years, by you know, you haven't met a patient that wasn't depressed or depressed knowing they're going to die. But that's not what's causing them to ask for what they're asking for, you know. And I've sure. had patients that were bed bound for a year and never took the medication and others who just recently, you know, were bed bound. And, you know, to them, that was called so everybody's quality of life and their you know, version of autonomy is going to be different. Someone was asking in our uh, breakout about does a medical professional have to be at the bedside? And no, you know, in, in the beginning, we were a lot of patients that were taking uh, the medication that we didn't hear about. And we get a lot of calls, City of Hope, UCLA, where the patients and family have the medication and, but they, but the patient doesn't want the family touching it. The patient doesn't want the family be the one to hand it over. I think there's a lot of anxiety about, oh, I don't want my family to feel like they've done this. So, you know, we've gone in a, a number of times just to be the person there that day, to be in the background, to mix the medication and support the family that way. But um, when you, even when you say what's bedside, I like to have the patient drink the medication and then, you know, get back and be, you know, a bug on the wall and let it be the family's experience and, you know, and give them some ideas of what to do and make sure they're hearing their voices at the, at the end and all. But in terms of medical professionals, the paperwork asked was the doctor or was a trained medical professional there, but that can be anyone that knows how to safely handle the medication. And, you know, it's about saying like, oh, this breathing or this color change, or these are the things we expect and are normal. And, and that's why working with doulas and, you know, I, I, I wanted to mention about, you know, homeless people. We've had people that didn't have a place to take the medication or, or didn't know where to go. Um, sometimes someone's living with someone, but they say, no, that's not going to happen here. So we need to work on those networks, you know, we have our RN group and our doula group and things like that. So we can find those resources. I have to help people get a place. Okay. Yeah. And I, Karen kind of got to it, but there isn't a registry, but your doctor will fill out, they do have to fill out these forms and that's what they submit to the California Department of Public Health. Yeah. But that is not like information that like, I can Google your name and see if you're oh. in there. It's real, it's all anonymous information. So yeah, it's all anonymous. That's where the data comes from. Yeah. 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 And um, I, I, Laura, I'll call on you in just one minute. I do want to just point out, I'm fine with staying on longer, um, but it is after one thirty. If anyone has to leave, where did Laura go? I oh, there you are, Laura. Go ahead and take yourself off mute. Oh, I was just going to respond to the registry too. Um, in, in New Mexico, which is another state where it's legal, you are in a registry for that reason because um, they want to know how many people have elected to do this, but it is anonymous. Yeah. 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 The forms that we submit do ask the name and the age and the diagnosis, but you know the way the way, the way California government works. I have. I have a hard time feeling like they keep track of any names. There's very little they seem to keep track of. And the times when I've reported facilities where we've had issues or problems, you know, nothing's ever come of that either. So, you know, I don't have a lot of hope for some of that, but. Can I ask a question of Marcia Sloan? You mentioned about um, morphine. Was your husband in pain? Is that why he, he was, I didn't know if it was morphine was being used for pain or being used as a, uh, as a sedative value at, and when he did the VSED? Um, it was my mother. I, excuse me. <laughs> and, uh, it's been so long <laughs> since you yeah, thought right. I forgot already. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, it was my mom. But, um, uh, you know, she, 
And please, Angela uh, or Karen, I am not a nurse, but my understanding is that, you know, a couple days before she died, uh, you know, her or, you know, her bodily processes are beginning to shut down. And and so it's it, it's emotionally disconcerting. Uh, for which the anti-anxiety medication is there and it's also it, your body process is, is shutting down and uh, it's a time when you want to have morphine and I do remember uh, maybe on that a day or maybe just the night before uh, she died the nurse said you don't want her to wake up anymore uh, because it's it's the end of her life. It's the end of her body, and the morphine is is not going to make it something uh, a painful experience. So um, I think it's so important to remember that morphine doesn't cause the death. The patient is dying, whether it's cancer or cardiac or whatever the diagnosis. The body is shutting down, as you say. And so a lot of my early teaching now is on even when I ask, are they still eating? you know, we stop eating because our GI system is shutting down. And, you know, morphine is great for the lungs. My patient the other day had a terrible, had had pneumonia. His lungs were in difficult shape. So breathing was so, so painful. Morphine really helps to ease some of those accessory lung muscles to help make breathing easier. But it also helps with the pain when people have all this severe cancer pain. So you let them know it's okay if they're not eating, okay if they're not pooping, but we need those things to happen because in California and all the United States, we have to use the GI system for the medication. So we need those receptors to help you know, pick up the medication and get the medication into the blood system. Uh, you know, A couple of the drugs work right away to put the patient in a coma and the other drugs stop the respiratory and cardiac activity. So. The more you can explain and the more different times you explain, the more prepared the family is for the ingestion day. Yeah, and I think too with VSAT, it, like it's the end of life. So whatever is happening is going on at your natural end of life, breathing is gonna become more difficult. So that's what you're getting that palliative care or hospice care usually for. Yeah. Yes, but it's not the morphine that causes death. Even if it's like, oh, they gave the last dose. No, it's it's the disease. Okay, well, just a reminder, I'll go ahead and um, we'll send out a follow-up email, It'll probably come out next week and you'll have the recordings of last week and this week. And then we'll also have, um, a link that will give you all the resources that we discussed. And there's also just gonna be like a little survey in there. So this was just kind of brief overviews of stuff, but I would love to hear if there's something that you wanna go more in detail with, or if there's a topic that you wanna hear about that we didn't cover so that we can better plan, um, you know, webinars across the year for Californians. So I do thank you all for joining us. Thank you to all our volunteers and partners that joined us today. I um, really appreciate everyone's time. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. Nico. Thanks, Les. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.